JBS presents the Hampton Synagogue's Author Discussion Series with Rabbi Avraham Bronstein. Please welcome Joshua Cohn to the hand of the Thank you. Well, pleasure to have you, Joshua. It's nice to be here. Okay, and you have told us before that you were going to begin tonight's program with a short reading. So um, just set that up for us. What, are you, what part of the book are you going to be reading? What's happening? I, is this the beginning? Sounds you know, good. it's a good place to begin. I, I, it, it, this is a hard book to, um, I think, to, to read a small portion of because uh, there's a very, very long setup. And then, you know, about halfway through, the Netanyahu show up. Mm -hmm. So if you just read when the Netanyahu show up, it just, you know, it's, it's, a, little, it's a little too Marx Brothers. <laughs> so uh, I'm going to start uh, with the, the, uh, the narrator, uh, who's a guy named uh, Ruben Blum. And uh, uh, he is a, he's telling the story of, uh, of when he's asked to take around uh, you know, a then obscure and arguably throughout his entire life obscure Israeli academic, uh, Benzio Netanyahu, um, for a job interview. But I'll just read the, uh, the beginning. Oh, and I should also say he's a, uh, uh, he's a professor of um, taxation studies which I don't know if that's a thing, but it should be now. Right, it sounds exciting. This is very exciting. It's very exciting. You know, it's always good to know what you owe, right? Uh, my name is Ruben Blum, and I'm an, yes, N historian. Soon enough, though, I guess I'll be historical, by which I mean I'll die and become history myself in a rare type of transformation traditionally reserved for the purer scholars. Lawyers die and don't become the law. Doctors die and don't turn into medicine. But biology and chemistry professors pass away and decompose into biology and chemistry. They mineralize into geology. They disperse into their science, just as surely as mathematicians become statistics. The same process holds true for us historians. In my experience, we're the only ones in the humanities for whom this holds true. The only ones who become what we study. We age, we yellow, we go wrinkled and brittle along with our materials until our lives subside into the past to become the very substance of time. Or maybe that's just the Jew in me talking. Goyim believe in the word becoming flesh, but Jews believe in the flesh becoming word a more natural, rational incarnation. By way of further introduction, I will now quote a remark made to me by the who shall remain nameless then president of the American Historical Association when I met him at a symposium back in my student days just after the Second World War. Ah, he said, limply pressing my hand. Blum, did you say? A Jewish historian? Though the man surely intended this remark to wound me, it merely succeeded in bringing delight. And even now, I find I can smile at the description. I appreciate its accidental imprecision and the way the double entendre can function as a type of psychological test. A Jewish historian. When you hear that, what do you think? What image springs to mind? The point is, the epithet as applied is both correct and incorrect. I am a Jewish historian but I am not an historian of the Jews, or I've never been one professionally. Instead, I'm an American historian, or I was. After half a century in the professorate, I was recently retired from my post as the Andrew William Mellon Memorial Professor of American Economic History at Corbin University in Corbindale, New York, in the occasionally rural, occasionally wild heart of Chautauqua County, just inland from Lake Erie, among the apple orchards and apiaries and dairies, or as dismissive, geographically illiterate New York City folk insist on calling it upstate. 
I myself was once one of these city folk, and though that old wisdom is false, that teachers learn more from their students than vice versa, I did manage to pick this up early on, never call Corbindale upstate. Though my initial focus was on the economics of the pre-American British colonial period, my reputation, such as it is, was made in the field of what's now referred to as taxation studies, and especially for my research into the history of tax policies' influence on politics and political revolutions. To be sure, I never much enjoyed the field, but it was open to me. Rather, the field didn't exist until I discovered it, and like a bumbling Columbus, I only discovered it because it was there. By the time I got into academia, America was already crowded. Even American economic history was already crowded, and I've always had a decent head for numbers. Taking on the history of taxes got me out of the ghetto of colonial catalactics, and eventually even out of America itself into the European city-states, feudal tax farming, church tithes, antiquities development of customs duties and trade tariffs, all the way back to the Rosetta Stone and even the Bible, both of which, most people forget, are substantially just tax documents. What else is salient? I wish I knew. But do we ever know? I used to open certain of my classes by paraphrasing Twain, who himself was paraphrasing Franklin, who for his part was presumably plagiarizing Brighton's Untold. Nothing can be said to be certain in this world, except death and taxes and the due dates of your papers. So the novel is called The Netanyahu's, but as we just found out, the main, type, the main speaker, right, yeah. the, the primary character, is actually a Jewish academic who lives in upstate New York, mm -hmm. whose, name is not, whose name is not a Netanyahu, <laughs> uh, right? Um, so tell us a little bit more. So who is this Ruben Blum? Uh, what makes him tick? What's his background? I, you know, I, I, he was, uh, uh, in my mind, everything that the source of this story wasn't. Mm -hmm. So I should probably, the, the source of the story was um, toward the end of uh, 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 Harold Bloom's life. Um, uh, Harold Bloom, the literary critic, sorry, Yale for years, uh, uh, one of the few critics who's most famous for his best idea. Most people are famous for not their best idea, but, but, but you know, people are probably familiar with, with his, um, theory of belatedness and literary influence. Um, anyway, he's uh, getting on in years and he wants to maybe consider writing a memoir. Uh, and he didn't want to really work with anyone from the university. And uh, for a number of reasons, I think. It was, you know, I think he was, he was ready to tell everyone where the bodies were buried, mm -hmm. right? And, uh, and I spent a fair amount of time with him in New Haven, and, um, but he was very ill, and he was, uh, uh, it was painful for him to sit for, for really you know, 20 minutes at a stretch. It was, it, was, it was tough. But so I would get these little stories. And he always had the TV on on mute. He was like from that generation of like, you keep the TV on all day, but mute. Mm -hmm. It's interesting. And, uh, and BB comes up on the, on the screen, you know, and, uh, and Harold says, you know, I met that guy. And I, I'm thinking in the 90s when he was UN ambassador, like, you know, wait, wait, wait. and he said, no, I think he was 10 or something, uh, when I had to take around his father. And the reason why I'm answering this question in, in, in the, is that, a large part of Harold's story was Harold Bloom, born in the Bronx, doesn't speak English for the first couple years of his life, raised speaking you know, Yiddish, you know, somehow manages to convince um, this country and this language that he is the expert on British romantic poetry of the 19th century and, uh, and an eminent Shakespearean, right? It's like an only in America kind of thing. Mm -hmm. and. Uh, uh, the anti-Semitism, uh, I, I guess the epithet that would be most usually applied to it is the casual anti-Semitism, which I always think is an interesting adjective to use, uh, that he faced early in his career, where how could you possibly have an opinion or know enough about, you know, Shelley or Wordsworth? Like, you know, have you ever been on a Heath? 
You know, like, what is a Heath? Right. right. Uh, I think that, that um, I wanted to make, uh, and, and Harold was able to break a lot of those barriers because he was a stone cold genius. And also he didn't take any from anyone. Mm -hmm. I wanted to write the version of, of that academic in that period where they're just kind of getting into um, mainstream post-war academic life at quote unquote better universities um, who didn't have all of that energy and genius. And like Ruben Bloom, yeah. like he breaks none of these barriers. Right. I mean, he's not a uh, he's not a genius professor of romantic poetry. He's a professor of taxation studies, mm -hmm. right? He's not he doesn't have this like Bloomian photographic memory, right? Eidetic memory which which Harold had. Uh, he's just the schlep. He's a guy who's just trying to do his job. You know, he's writing books about the 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 early uh, 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 George Boltwell, who was the early founder of the IRS. You know, this is what he's interested in. And I wanted to, to kind of uh, 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 explore the anti-Harold. Right, meaning Reuben, the, mm. the character in the book, instead of fighting the anti-Semitism that comes up or right. things like that, he finds himself flattened by them time and time again. Right? He ends up playing the part. Yeah, he ends up playing the part. He he does literally. It. He's Santa Claus. At the, he's um, Santa at the Claus at the faculty Christmas party. He absolutely is. So the other people can enjoy the holiday, you right. know, right? But I mean, he he um, right. You know, Harold called people out, right? When he saw something, he he pointed at it and he uh, uh, um, and and he he rocked every boat. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to write the guy who didn't, we, who internalized very hard not to rock any boats. Right, and 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 so when. Benzio Netanyahu shows up, he's mortified. Right. Yeah. Are we supposed to ask ourselves, by the way, just a general question, are we supposed to ask how much of the story is true based on the fact that, you know, is Corbindale supposed to be like a fill-in for Cornell? Is um, Harold Bloom kind of based on the recollections that Harold Bloom had? Are we supposed to ask ourselves how much of this actually happened or just enjoy the story as it I is? I mean, I certainly asked Harold uh -huh. how much of the story he's telling me actually happened. And then Jean Bloom, uh, who's, who's still with us, you know, she comes into the room and says, that's not how it went on. You know, but I mean, this is, you know, a guy in his you know, late 80s who's telling me a story that happened in 1959, 1960, mm -hmm. right? And, uh, and... Uh, yeah, I mean, he's not reporting dialogue to me, but uh, uh, what, what actually happened, as far as I uh, understand it, is he is called into the uh, history department, and he is a, thinks that it's a mistake because he's in the English department. He's mm -hmm. like, why is, why is this guy in the history department? Why does he want to talk to me? Like, what, you know? And he goes in and they say, you know, as you know, we have an opening in medieval history. <laughs> Um, and Harold's like, okay, sure. And we want you to take this guy around and see if he's one of us, mm -hmm. right? And Harold says, you know, why? I don't know anything about medieval. Like, I, you know, I don't even know when the Middle Ages were. They're in the middle of something, you know? It's like, it's not my <laughs> thing. Uh, uh, and he says, oh, no, because he's, 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 he's one of your people. And, um, and so, yeah, that, that, that part of it, Actually happened. Actually happened, and he did show up with uh, uh, with Sila, with his Benzion showed up with his wife and his three kids. And, you know, it, 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 the uh, Yoni was thirteen, Bibi was ten, Ido was seven. Okay. Yeah, but right, obviously, like yeah. the, the the interactions themselves and the way everything kind of played off and then blew up. That's that was totally your invention. It's all my invention. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it, it, in a Harold story uh, that he originally told me. You know, Harold was great at telling stories in which he's the hero, mm -hmm. right? So in Harold's story, the moment they told him that he had to do this, he was just like... No. Right. right. <laughs> you know, or he was just screaming and, you know, and then when Jean comes in the room, she goes, that's not what happened, Harold. You actually, you know, <laughs> so, yeah. Got it. And I was thinking about that because just your description now of, of the book's central character, mm -hmm. the narrator, is so telling because you really do present him and Ben Sion Netanyahu as polar opposites, 
right? Um, you have Ruben on one side who's trying so hard to blend into American life, not right. always successfully, right. but he's really trying very hard to assimilate, right? He's sending Christmas cards, he's showing up at the faculty Christmas party, yep. right? He's living in a community where he's the only Jewish family. Mm -hmm. And then you have, on the other hand, Ben-Sion Netanyahu, who's a student who's a um, protege of Zev Jabotinsky, mm -hmm. who's all about Jewish separatism, Jewish nationalism. And he's basically saying, you're never going to blend in. And that was what he was telling Jewish communities all around the world. Right, but, but, but they're also very similar in the sense of Ben Zion Netanyahu, for all of his, you know, for all of his, you know, Galut just ends in death, you know, um, uh, 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 Jewish separatism is Jewish nationalism, mm -hmm. right? Uh, the, the, the messianic sphere has been transmogrified to the political, and all of that, right? Uh, he's still just trying to be a mediocre professor. Mm -hmm. You know, like, he, he, uh, uh, he's the guy who goes around and earns a living by telling people all throughout America that they have to make Aliyah, but he lives, he's living in Denver, then he's living in, 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 in suburban Philly, then he's living in Long Island, you know, and, and then he's like living in Ithaca. Mm -hmm. So it's it, it, like in a way, y yes, ideologically, they're completely, you know, dissimilar, but they're both trying to uh, find roles for themselves in a like deracinated space. It's like um, almost mirror images, right? Yeah. On one hand, Ruben is trying so hard to assimilate and the harder that he's trying to do that, his Jewishness stands out more and more. That's one of the themes that runs through the book. On the uh, other absolutely. hand, Netanyahu is trying so hard to stand out and say, I'm who I am and not you, right. but he finds himself more and more entwined in an American academic environment. That's what you're saying. Absolutely. I mean, you know, there are many things that I, I have the sense that Ben Zion had a hard time accepting, mm -hmm. right? I think he was a difficult man. And uh, right, that comes through very clearly. Yeah. <laughs> but, but, you know, but two of the, the, the things that I think are most notable about it are he, he, he could never really adjust himself or come to grips with the fact that um, an academic is someone who... Uh, uh, dispassionately examines facts. Um, he always had this idea that his work had to be politically useful. And in an American context, that's poisonous for an academic career, right? That like you're constantly trying to like produce work that serves a certain ideological purpose, you're not gonna I mean, get- maybe, you can tell that to Cornell West. <laughs> right, right. But I'm saying when he was trying to do, when Ben Benzio and I would, was mm -hmm. trying to do it in the States, it was not... Not the same thing. Right. Okay. And, and, but he also is suffering from this... I mean, I guess maybe we should back up and, and you know, Benzion Netanyahu uh, uh, is born, um, born in Warsaw, but he really grows up in, 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 in Palestine. His father, Natan Milikovsky, is a rabbi, um, uh, kind of just drops the family in, in Yerushalayim and then says, see you later and then goes around and um, begins doing um, kind of like fundraising stuff for uh, different movements around within the revisionist community. Um, but Ben Zion Netanyahu kind of grows up almost with, basically without a father. And he uh, really is to kind of please his absent father dedicates himself to the revisionist cause. He's an editor of Hayarden and and, and, Dvar and these, these, these revisionist journals uh, uh, that all kind of follow uh, uh, Jabotinsky's line. And he becomes more and more radical, right? And, and, and uh, really when, I guess, we, we, the American way of saying it would be when the immigrants start taking his jobs, mm -hmm. right? because he wants to be a professor of European uh, medieval history. And every year that he's studying at the very early Hebrew University, you know, dozens of qualified <laughs> professors are escaping Europe. People who like are taught at Friedrich Wilhelm in, in you know, in, 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 you know, right? People who, you know, the, the head of the, the history department at uh, the University of Berlin, right? And, so in, in Hebrew University, they're like, if we could hire the cream of the crop of European medievalists, why are we gonna get this like homegrown mm -hmm. guy? And 
he was so frustrated in that, in that situation that he gave himself entirely over to political uh, 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 involvement. Um, had some little light, light terrorism history, you know, set off a bomb or two, you know, and, um, and then gets a job uh, essentially as a secretary for, uh, uh, for uh, a Jabotinsky front organization in the United States. But of course, a couple, you know, weeks after he shows up, Jabotinsky dies. Mm -hmm. and, um, and it's Benzio Netanyahu who, who basically has to deal with the body. Which is interesting, and, and 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 Palestine won't, you know, the British won't take the body, and so it's like uh, there's also the sense that he maybe stayed in the states, out of that sense, you know, as long as Jabotinsky is buried in Long Island, that's where he's going to be. Yeah, yeah. Oh, I mean, he sensed he wasn't welcome either. Totally. I right. mean, he was he was frozen out of everything. Yeah. Right. It's an interesting thought because I mean, that's what happens when you try to blow up a university. Well, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, you put it that way. Right, but, but, but yeah. he was that guy who was like, why don't they give me a job here? Right. And then, you know. No. Makes sense. Makes sense. Makes sense. Makes sense. So, so I was thinking about it like this also. The, Netanya the Netanyahu's, right, mm -hmm. Ben Sion and his family don't come across in the book relatively well. Right? Mm -hmm. They come across as kind of ill-mannered and not really fitting in. And then the end of the book goes totally off the rails in like, you know, hilariously madcap kinds of ways. So it seems like the interview was a failure. Um, I might ask you about that later, but it seems like the interview doesn't go well, and certainly his interactions with, um, with Blum don't go very well. And you're almost made to think, like, these guys like, really have no idea what they're doing in the States, and like, it's just not going to work. Right. On the other hand, like, Blum himself is not really a sympathetic character. Yeah. So on one hand, the two of them are kind of um, avatars for this like, huge question about Jewish identity or Jewish nationalism, and what does it mean to be Jewish in America in the second half of the 20th century, right? And they're, they're playing out these arguments among them. On the other hand, neither of them is really a very compelling character in the sense where you don't like either of them. Right. And I'm, I'm wondering what you think about that. I, I like both of them. <laughs> I mean, but I'm a pervert, you know? Like, I, I, I um, you know, I, I, I tend to think of, you know, the great, you know, uh, 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 the great Cohen brothers, mm -hmm. you know, uh, that line from Lebowski where it's just, you know, you're not wrong. You're just an. Uh huh. And and that was that. What that was Benzio Netanyahu. He wasn't wrong. He was just an. I I I find myself very attracted to, um, to a person who, um, to a person who can't come to grips with the limitations of the profession they practice, right? You know, I, one of the reasons that I write books is you know because I can't do anything else that makes the world uh, uh, in an image that I prefer, mm -hmm. right? And so I've, and I've, you know, I've resigned myself to knowing that like the best I can do is make a book that, and it's very hard to do it already, but like to make a book that shows what I think and what I feel. And I've completely abandoned the idea of changing anything, even changing anything in myself, mm -hmm. right? And when you have someone like Benzio Netanyahu, who throughout his life, and uh, it certainly when raising his children in this weird hothouse-like environment where they're living in Cheltenham, PA, but they're also not, you mm -hmm. know? They're, they're living in his feuds of the 30s, right? Uh, uh, I, he, he was a guy who, um, who has this, you know, almost pathological resentment, but, and it can be directed against the people that he thinks have thwarted his career, but really what it is is it, he has a resentment against the limitations of history. Mm -hmm. Just because we understand history or we can write history, uh, no, nobody's learned from it, right? Um, certainly uh, uh, the Jews of America uh, haven't learned from history, right? Because they're still in America. Mm -hmm. Right, uh, and I I find myself deeply attracted to that to that character um, uh, because he will never be he'll never be um, reconciled with his with his task with his profession and for the Ruben, Ruben Blum thing I I 
I tend to, I mean, and maybe this is a little, you know, maybe this is uh, in some way I'm, uh, I'm talking down to him, mm -hmm. right? But, I mean, I, I, I have so many relatives like that, you know? I mean, who would never rock a boat and, um, and internalized humiliations and... Um, and I felt very sympathetic. I could think they're idiots for it, but mm -hmm. it felt that's what it was then. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Okay. Last question for me. The question is: Imagine there's somebody in the audience here tonight who hasn't read the book yet. Mm -hmm. Hard to imagine, but let's imagine. Yeah. Right. And they pick up the book tonight and they read it over the weekend or maybe after Tisha B'Av. Huh. Um, what question do you want them to be thinking about while they're reading? I. I don't. Know. I, what, what question? Why didn't Josh say anything about the fact that the book was actually funny? <laughs> That's a good, no, I mean, I, I don't know, you know, I, this book was, um, this book was uh, 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 very recently introduced into evidence in the uh, Olmert BB defamation uh, 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 case. And I, I, I gave a deposition um, really to protect my Israeli publisher and, you know, ah, and, um, and I'd, I'd spent a long time, I mean, you know, it, it's sort of like, it, it's like an abusive relationship with most people. It's like, it's like, uh, did Bibi read the book yet? Did he say anything? <laughs> like, like, is he going to call? Is he going to call? You know, and I, I, my Israeli publisher, my translator is a very good friend of mine was like, there, there was, you know, there was this question of has Bibi read it yet? Right. Mm -hmm. And so only a couple of weeks ago. Uh, I got to watch as the lawyer uh, read out excerpts to Bibi on the stand, <laughs> and um, and uh, so you're like watching his expression, watching his expression, watching yeah, and um, and it was it was it was funny, but but one of the things that I thought that um, he had one major criticism of the of, of of the book, which I thought was like, oh man, I did okay then, you know. Uh, he says, I don't know why he makes my mother's English so bad. My mother spoke perfect English. <laughs> right. And I, I, think, uh, uh, I think that, uh, I didn't bring it up because, because it was that moment where, and you see this with BB a lot, where he, you know, he does that code shifting thing, mm -hmm. right? Well, when he met with Bennett to, you know, talk about coalitions, mm -hmm. they spoke in English. So, totally. Right. Yeah. And, yeah. And, and, and it was understood that they would speak in English to each other and nobody else was going to be in the room. Right. 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 And so I, I think that um, one thing that is, a, is an interesting thing to, to, to think about is read, and I, I certainly thought about this as I was trying to find the style for the, to write the book in, is how often do I switch like that? Mm -hmm. in my life and why and when, you know? I think that, that you know, to, who am I uh, to myself? Who am I to others? Um, is there some uh, consistency, right, in, in, in the way in which uh, I inhabit this identity that I apparently have? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's yeah. awesome. Thank yeah. you so much. Thank you. Thank you.